Hi, my name is Jonathan Brill. I'm a product futurist. And what that means is I help companies rethink what they do based on emerging technologies and then help them prototype new product opportunities for their clients. I'm particularly interested in the future of food and how food, technology, and health are going to come together in the next 20 years. I think a great place to start thinking about this is the tomato. We think of it as this really traditional vegetable, and yet it's not. A thousand years ago, in ancient Peru, it grew in the mountains as a wild fruit. It was inedible. And about 200 years later, the Aztecs brought it up to Mexico, and they hybridized it. They genetically engineered it into an acidic little orange fruit like this that the Spanish then brought to Europe. The nobles in southern Europe didn't enjoy this fruit, and so it was genetically engineered a second time to turn it into the red, sweet, meaty fruit that we eat today. This is how the tomato moved around the world. When my grandmother was born at the beginning of the 20th century, the tomato wasn't eaten in northern Europe yet. I'd like to introduce you to her. She was an amazing woman. She grew up in the central United States in a state called Oklahoma. Drought, famine were a common course of human events. My grandmother grew up in one of the most advanced economies in the world, and yet she and two and a half million other farmers had to leave the American Midwest as the result of a drought. They decided at the end of the Second World War that they were going to create a new global food system that would make sure that an agricultural collapse like this didn't happen in the United States again. They took the technologies from the world wars, put them together, and managed to triple the food output of the world and have Three, almost three times as many people on this planet living in peace. It's a stunning accomplishment, but today, many of these technologies are over 100 years old, and they're topping out. I think with emerging technologies, with new things coming down the pike, we can do much, much better. I run a small product development firm in California, and we think about these large-scale issues, and then we help clients funnel them down to product opportunities and product concepts. Like I said, a lot of this is in the food space. I'm going to show you some of what we're looking at tonight. We're particularly interested in technologies that create what we call gain without pain. Technologies that, by their nature, remove persistent problems. That, by their nature, help ideas move around the, more, around the world more quickly. So it doesn't take a thousand years to make another tomato. And technologies that reshape our relationship with nature, with the world around us. So instead of, like was so often the case for most of human history, we aren't completely dependent on nature. Nature serves humanity. When my grandparents' generation thought about the food system they wanted to create, they were, they were really clear about their objectives. They wanted something that was reliable, they wanted something that was safe, and they wanted something that was convenient. And today, for most of the world, we have that in spades. To me, it's amazing. Whenever you build a complex system, you have to make trade-offs, and so you set priorities. They got theirs. I think in the course of that, we lost a lot of the beauty that is in food. We're aesthetic beings. If we're going to create meaningful change, we need to think about how to make the future of food more beautiful. The only problem with this is it takes a long time to deal with change on the scale that we're talking about. And I think about what I enjoy, my grandmother would be horrified of it. Aesthetics change between generations. As a result, we need to think very carefully about what technologies are going to make a better life for our grandchildren and what it is that they want. Today, there are two major technology trends that we, that we generally talk about in the world, and they're going to shape the way we deal with food. The first is the tagging, tracking, and modeling of almost everything in the world. This movement, this movement from thinking about products to thinking about systems and how products interact in them. The second thing that's happening is the personalization of almost anything. The idea that instead of making one thing for many people, uh, we're going to start to increasingly make the right thing for you. We're moving from tracking containers to tracking molecules. 
That's fascinating to me, is we get more granular on that side of the technology. Because what it enables is the rise of what I call personal chemistry. Today, we do occasional chemical testing of our bodies, like pregnancy tests. Tomorrow, we're going to increasingly test every molecule that goes in it. This is a gluten sensor made by six uh, sensor labs that's going to break through a lot of the issues that celiacs have with eating out. A really impressive technology. The thing we're not talking about yet, and I think it's one of the major changes in the next 15 years in the world, is synthetic biology. This is a DNA laser printer. It actually encodes the DNA of life so that you can put it into a living uh, being and change it. You can design it. Today, most of this is being used for designing things like yeasts and E. coli, so that instead of a yeast uh, outputting something like alcohol for beer, it outputs another chemical. So what does all of this have to do with the future of food? And what does it have to do with health? One third of food is wasted today. In America, we do much worse. About 45% of what goes into my refrigerator ends up going into the garbage. A lot of this is due to me, but a lot more is due to the supply chain. Foods that should last up to a month in our refrigerators only last a couple of days because it takes so long to get there. I'd like to talk to you for a moment about an incredible farm in Ohio called the Chef's Garden. And I think they're at the leading edge of a new approach to food production. They tag and track every plant, every leaf that they grow from the seed all the way through packing and picking all the way to the chef's refrigerator. And through that entire process, they also control the atmosphere. They control the temperature that that food is at. As a result, when it gets to a Michelin star restaurant, the finest herbs, like these four-leaf clovers, that when you touch them, they will instantly wilt, will last for up to a month. We've been thinking about what happens when you start to consumerize those technologies. How do, how do we mass market that? They, those guys are very high end. And this is a concept we're calling the micro reefer. It takes shipping containers and starts to, instead of filling them with apples, control them in an independent atmosphere. So each fruit has its own little world that it lives in. And we can speed up and slow down the ripening process as it moves from farm to market. This type of technology is going to be enabled uh, by other supporting uh, devices. This is a soft robotic picker. It picks even delicate things like strawberries at a rate of 300 times a minute without damaging them. We're going to see robots like this uh, in, in the food assembly process. And we're going to see robots of similar character starting to move packages around warehouses much more quickly, making it possible to really personalize the fruit that we get. This is a self-driving truck. It's actually licensed right now to drive itself in Nevada. It's amazing. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow trucks to operate 24 hours a day, trucks to operate with much larger loads. And as a result, it'll double or triple the speed at which uh, freight, ground freight moves across the country. It's going to make the economy of the sort of thing we're talking about viable. We're also fascinated with and working on autonomous vehicles. Today, we talk about the autonomous car, and you might have heard about things that Google's creating. Uh, yesterday, it was announced that Apple is going to produce an autonomous vehicle by 2019. Those are all really cool. But when I think about why we actually use a car, there are three reasons. We use them to get to work. We use them to bring their, our kids to soccer practice, really good uses for an autonomous vehicle. But the third and most annoying thing we do is we run errands. There's no reason for you to be doing that in the 21st century. What if a team of robots were moving around your city very slowly, very safely, uh, maybe at the speed of a bicycle, and if you were to say, I want a steak from my favorite steakhouse and a wine from my favorite wine store, they would go and pick those up and somewhere in the process meet each other and trade those goods and bring them to you specifically. That would be amazing, and it would change the nature of last mile delivery, which is the big problem in the food space. We do a lot of work on smart kitchens as well. 
It turns out that the kitchen hasn't really changed in something like 40 years. Uh, the last major thing we brought into the kitchen was the microwave. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. We've been looking at industrial food equipment and how, that, how far that's advanced and how to bring the simplification that those technologies create into the kitchen. This is an immersion circulator. And what I love about it is it allows even a novice chef, even your child, to safely make a perfect piece of salmon every time in 20 minutes. It's going to change the way you cook. My grandmother, she was a really interesting woman, um, but she was afraid of a lot of things. She was afraid of sushi. And the reason she was afraid of sushi is she grew up in a landlocked place. She had no concept of fish growing up. She had no concept of certainly raw fish. It was new to her. I look at my life. Over the course of my lifetime, the amount of foods I can get in a grocery store has increased 10 times. That's a thousandfold what my grandparents were able to, uh, to access. It's amazing. What we eat, the things that we taste and smell, are chemicals. And we can taste and smell about a thousand chemicals that exist in natural foods, another couple of thousand that are synthetically added. Traditionally, when we think about recipes, we think about going to Provence, what grows in Provence, France, and let's cook with that. It's very regional. And yet, when it's at least as efficient or more efficient to buy maybe uni from Japan than fresh caught fish from down the street, those rules never, no longer apply. So we've been creating a piece of software that we call Why Flavors Work that explores how unlikely flavor combinations might work together. We've been working with this guy, Jamie Simpson. Uh, many American chefs think of him as almost the Willy Wonka of flavor. He's an unbelievable cook. And I'd like to show you some of the things that we've been making together. This is a piece of cod that's been salt cured with cinnamon. On top of it, I believe, is balm and flour. Uh, off to the right of it is some uh, fennel frond and uh, basil sauce and cherry sauce. There's no way to really imagine how this would taste, but it's fantastic. And the reason you can't imagine it is because there's no real historical precedent for it. You can't find something 20% different in a cookbook. This here is fantastic to me. It's almost a piece of art. It's a salmon carpaccio with fermented garlic. It's got uh, buttermilk yogurt and uh, on it are some marjoram leaves. It's an absolutely fascinating dish. This one really got me, though, because I had no idea how to even dream about really what the flavors would be. It's a lamb with kumquats that have been seared. Uh, there are clementines, mint. There's a chocolate jus and strawberry powder. It was fantastic, um, but I was very concerned about eating it. What this suggests to me is that our children will have a much broader palate than we do, just as our grandparents had a much smaller palate than us. It's really fun to talk about how cuisine and molecules and all of that stuff, but I'm also interested in the new relationship that personalized chemistry uh, creates between food and health, between nutrition and health. It turns out that most pharmacy today, much of pharmacy today, is fermented using yeasts that are modified using the same DNA laser printers that I just showed you earlier. It's pretty cool. Uh, the fascinating thing is they're fermented. And what's fascinating about it is that my grandmother also fermented things. She made her own vinegars. What happens when these two things come together, when we start to have synthetic biology happening at home? Two things, I think, occur. One is we start creating our own medical molecules. That's going to change the nature, the nature of health and our relationship with pharma companies. The second thing that's going to happen, and it's going to happen very rapidly, is that we're going to change our relationship with flavor. Because instead of make, buying flavor in the form of spices, we'll make it ourselves. My grandmother had maybe 10 herbs and spices in her pantry. Each one of those had a specific molecule that defined the flavor of that spice, maybe two. A decent restaurant today has about 40. What if, what if you could stock every possible flavor in your pantry? We've been working a lot with the University of Pennsylvania's Orkin Tehan 
to think about this. What happens when we have synthetic spices in our house? And this is a fascinating device to me. Uh, it's a concept we've been developing called a flavorizer. And it allows you to take medical molecules, nutritional molecules, and flavor molecules and put them on your food. The last thing I'm going to talk to you about today is a product we call the Intestable. It's a concept. It's an ingestible device, and it does a daily bioscan of your intestine. This is really important because it turns out that there are more microbes in our intestines than there are cells in our body. Our intestinal system is critical for more than just digestion. Of course, it deals with nutritional intake, it deals with calorie intake, but it also deals with mood management, a range of mental disorders, uh, managing uh, the production and secretion of hormones. It's really, really important. And I think that the way that we do it now is kind of silly. We eat a whole bunch of yogurt or something as a probiotic and hope that that kind of takes care of the system. What's going to happen, I believe, in the future is what we call theragnostics, this combination of therapies and diagnostics. And so not only will this device go down your throat and do a bioscan, but it will also release very personalized medicine as you need it, controlling the shape of your gut biome, controlling your health, uh, enhancing your mood, making you a different sort of person. I think this is critical for thinking about the future of food and health, because what it does is it starts to separate what we actually need uh, from a health viewpoint from what we like to eat. And so food can free itself to become much, much more aesthetic, much, much more focused on beauty. Now, my grandmother was born at the beginning of the 20th century. I'm quite sure she'd be terrified of these ideas, but I think it's also important to think of the span of my grandmother's life. She grew up in a world without uh, running water, and she ended up in a world where there was a man on the moon. It's really hard to imagine the futures our grandchildren will live. But what we do know is that many of the ideas that we're expressing here in some form will become reality. And what we do know is that we want to create a better, tastier, more healthful food system for our children. And I'd like for you to come along with me in creating a world worth eating. Thank you.